I have been privileged to spend a great deal of time going back and forth in this part of the country, and I know that when you folks get weather out here, you get a lot of weather all at once. In the late 1800s, the blizzards that tore through this middle section of the country were legendary, ferocious, deadly. The writer Laura Ingalls Wilder, in her book, The Long Winter, where she wrote of her family's time living in the Dakota Territory, she describes as a girl what it felt like to be in her house on the prairie with a blizzard raging outside. Ms. Wilder wrote that it was like being in the house, isolated in that whirling whiteness where you couldn't even see a light from the house a little bit away and that every house was trapped in that whiteness, isolated within the town, and every town was isolated within the prairie, and that the white foamed around the house, even after dark, even after the last vestige of daylight should be gone, the storm would rage white with wild voices and sounds. And she said that a light can be seen through the blackest dark, and a cry can be heard a far way away, but no light or no cry could be heard in the midst of that whirling whiteness that encompassed heaven and earth. And though Miss Wilder at the time was snug and warm in her bed, she shivered. This is a true ghost story that happened in Minnesota in 1873. It was picked up by a local Minnesota paper at the time and then later reprinted in many papers across the country. So because it was printed in the paper, we know that it must be true. <laughs> On January 7th, 1873, John Seward set out from his home in Hersey Township. He was in the very north, my, my directions get a little uh, troubled sometimes, very southwest corner of Minnesota. So right above the Iowa border, Hersey Township. He set out with his team of oxen to gather some wood at Graham Lake, which was some miles away. It was a beautiful day. It had dawned fair and mild which made the blizzard that hit that area later that day all the more deadly because everyone had let their guard down. Like Mr. Weston, he drove his team to Graham Lakes, gathered his wood, and then as he turned to journey home, a blizzard hit out of a clear blue sky. Temperature dropped, storm started to rage. He and his oxen were encompassed in that white, unearthly fury. That blizzard raged for 48 hours. 70 people in that area of Minnesota would die, including Mr. Weston and his team of oxen. But first, he tried to survive. They struggled. They could recap his route from finding his oxen where he had had to abandon them in the snow. And when they retraced his route, they saw that he had passed within spitting distance of his own house, his own farm, but was so blinded by the storm that he did not see it. The track showed that he made a heartbreaking two circles around the farmhouse before he headed with his team north to Graham Lakes. Inside the house, his wife and his son had no idea that he had passed so close. They were huddled by the fire, listening to the wind howl and watching the wind blow snow as fine as flowers, stinging blasts of snow through every crack and crevice in the cabin. He continued up toward Grand Lakes where he made the difficult decision to abandon his oxen and continued on foot. That night, the first night of the storm, Mrs. Weston woke to what sounded like a knock at the door. 
She listened a moment and thought it must have just been the wind. Tried to go back to sleep, but the knock came again. What is wanted? She called. Did you know, a voice outside the door said, did you know that John was frozen to death? Paul? Is that you? She thought it was her brother, Paul Linden, who lived several farms over. Her son was also awake and he said, Mama, was that Uncle Paul? Did he just say that, that Paul, Paul has been frozen? They got up and struggled to open the door against the blasting wind, but saw no one outside, no trace of footsteps. Later, Paul Linden would confirm that he was nowhere near the Weston farmhouse that night. How in tarnation would I get over there in that kind of weather, he said. The next day, when the storm finally blew itself out, John Weston had not returned. So his neighbors mounted a search. A difficult day, they found the oxen where they had turned and choked, turned the yoke and choked to death in the snow. Found some small traces of John's path, but soon lost it in the blowing whiteness. One of his neighbors, a Mr. Coster, came home after that long day searching for John Weston, and Mr. Coster put his own horses up in the stable and then made his way toward his house. In his own words, I was halfway to the house when a figure came up the path from the creek. I looked, it was John Weston. I could tell because he was wearing that blue soldier's great coat from the war that he always wore. He has his hands tucked up under the little cape like he always did. He came right toward me. His face looked normal. He said to me, how goes it? I said, why Weston? I, th I thought you were frozen to death. I am, he said. You found my body a mile and a half northwest of Hersey. And then he vanished. Well, I kept walking into my house and once I got inside, it kind of struck me what had happened. I sat down hard in a chair. My wife said, what's wrong with you? I said, I think I've seen a ghost. John Weston's body wasn't found until the spring thaw finally started to melt some of the remains of that awful blizzard. They found his body by a slough where the snow had piled deep. He had fallen face forward, exhausted from his walk, grasped at reeds and grasses as he fell, blood gushing from his nose. Mr. Coster, was among the neighbors who found his body. And again, in his words, yeah, we found John's body. He was face down, turned him over. His hands were full of grasses. His face was full of blood. And there he lay by the slough where we found him, a mile and a half northwest of Hersey. I'm Clementine Ryder. It's been my pleasure to share these tales with you.